This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 157, recorded on July 20th, 2017. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, howdy. How are you doing? Right in the middle of summer. Very well. Oh, good. Here, it's really Deserve hot. It. It's really hot here. <laughs> Is it? Okay. <laughs> but there, I bet it's 72, right? Oh, it's our usual 72. <laughs> Someone wrote a letter saying they know that uh, in in San Diego, it's always 72 and sunny. It's not quite true, but it's close enough. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. How's everything out there in Ann Arbor? It's good. It's 86 degrees here and a little sticky. Sticky. It is. And it's mm. probably quiet there, right? Because most of the undergrads are not around. Well, except that it's, that it's art fair. Oh, so we right. have, yeah, tens of thousands of people descend on our town for three or four days and some really great juried artists. So it's um, it's pretty crazy. Even cycling to work is a little bit of a challenge because they've got uh, <laughs> booths all set up and people are parking everywhere. Do they have any microbial artists? They actually have um, bioartography that is a program organized here at the university. Um, scientists submit their lovely micrographs and then they're made into um, note cards or posters or sometimes quilts. And mm -hmm. then they're sold at a booth to raise money for travel for postdocs to go to meetings. Neat. That's yeah. pretty cool. Well, uh, lots of things happen here in New York, but I can't tell because uh, it's so big. And there's so many people that you never notice anything, <laughs> right? But uh, that's the way it is. And even though it's the middle of summer, there's still plenty of microbiology out there going on. And that's what that's what we do. We bring everyone microbiology. We have two papers today for you. Michael Schmidt, by the way, is on vacation uh, for a couple oh, of weeks. We're missing. So we'll give him the, this to him off. I told him it would be okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Let's uh, speak of you. I'm just kidding. You're, you're, you're wonderful. Everyone can take vacation. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, we have two papers, and, and we're going to start off with a, a snippet from Elio. What have you got for Alrighty. us? My paper has the following, the, the title, first of all, Assessment of the Potential Role of Streptomyces in Cave Moon Milk Formation. I'll explain. The authors are <laughs> Maciejewska, Adam, Naomi, Martinet, Tenconi, Kaliushinska, Delfos, Haniken, Burain, Compare, Carnot, our own Hazel Bart uh, Barton, who's been on for him, and Sebastian Regali. These folks, except for uh, Hazel, who's the only American here on the, in the group, are from Belgium and one is from Luxembourg. Mm. So they are all interesting people. So what is moon milk? I'll tell you, moon milk is a Speleothem. Now you know. <laughs> that, that explains it. I had to look that up. I, I thought it explains everything. Okay, so we start with speleothem. It's a term I hadn't run into before. It refers to secondary mineral deposits in caves. Like uh, it comes from speleo, which is cave, and them, which means theme deposit. So think about stalactite and stalagmites. They are speleothems. And they're made of calcium carbonate in various forms, like calcite and gypsum. Okay, what is moon milk? It's a strange name given to white deposit on cave surfaces, which when wet are rather soft and gooey, resembling cream cheese. <laughs> By the way, I'm posting this on our blog, and I have a picture of a little jar of cream cheese, and I say, it is not a speleothem. <laughs> Okay, so this moon moon milk, why the name? Nobody knows. It probably because maybe ancient people thought of frozen moonbeams, whatever. Uh, they were they can be as thick as one meter, although usually they're not as thick. So they cover the walls of some caves, and they're made of calcium 
carbonate. Why calcium carbonate makes these structures and not others is a big open question, and I don't think we know the answer to it. Uh, by the way, prehistoric artists use their fingers to make patterns on moon milk. Mm. It's like cream cheese. You can you can push on it and it, it makes an impression. That's it. That's it. That's exactly right. Now so these, they the, the ones that the cave uh, the people did in caves are have they since hardened so that we see what they did? Uh, I I I would assume so. Unless there's water dripping on it all the time, they would harden. Sure. So you can you can see them, and people have studied them, and uh, they make a lot out of it. Mm. Anyhow, they. Um, <laughs> Also, moon milk was also used as a remedy for uh, acid reflux, stomach reflux. Mm. <laughs> Not surprising, calcium carbonate. It's like, isn't yeah. Maalox something like that? Yeah. I think so. Anyhow, no, that's pro Anyhow, so how do this arise and why do we talk about it? Well, we talk about it because microbes are likely to be involved. And how are microbes involved? How do microbes contribute to the precipitation of calcium carbonate, and uh, they do it in various ways. But there are at least two mechanisms that may be involved. One is to raise the pH. When you raise the pH of around 8, calcium carbonate precipitates. Mm. Okay? So that's one reason. And the other reason is that it's thought that bacteria, especially streptomyces, as in the title of this paper, act as nucleation centers. So the... They, uh, the, the material, the calcium carbonate precipitates around them. And there's a lot of biochemistry involved. And in fact, this paper goes into it in a lot of detail. So what's the paper about? Well, it's a noble attempt to make sense out of conflicting data that have existed for some time. Conflicting because we're, you're talking here about a natural situation, which is not easy necessary to study. You can duplicate in the lab, which they did in this work, but duplicating something in the lab doesn't mean that that's an exact replica of what happens in nature, does it? So it's complicated business. And uh, they go into a great deal of detail about the biochemistry of these bugs. And they have, uh, so they isolate, first of all, they isolated uh, from a cave in Belgium called the Cave of the Springtails. La Grotte de Colombole. <laughs> they isolated 31 phylotypes of streptomyces. A phylotype is something which you define by some genomic property, like 16S RNA. And they looked at the genomes for uh, they look at the genomes of these bugs for genes that may be involved in ammonia formation, which would raise the pH. For instance, from the breakdown of urea or from reduction of nitrate and nitrite and other mechanisms. And all these bugs have, practically all of them have these genes. And if you look at the, the um, precipitates, you find filaments which look like they could be actinobacteria. It is the big group to which the streptomyces belong. Um, there's a side issue. The uh, filaments are thinner than what you usually see for actinobacteria, but they claim that this is because they're growing in a very oligotrophic or nuclear nutrient poor environment and therefore they get thin. All right, maybe so. Okay, so all of this is an argument for plausibility. It is possible that these bugs have what it takes to alkalinize the environment and they may also be able to act as nuclear nucleation centers. Okay, now where does this leave you? Well, this is not quite enough to nail anything down. It's just a plausibility argument. So they go to the next step, which is to make a moon milk in the lab. So how do you make moon milk in the lab? Well, you grow uh, the strains which has the strongest ability to break down urea and to um, cause the production of ammonia in various ways. So they use the genomic data to select from these 30 odd bugs, they select two of them, which look the most promising. So they grew them for several months in a urea containing medium and calcium and carbonate. And they found that after this time, there were abundant calcite, calcium carbonate deposits on the colonies. Leave out the urea, no deposits. Now, the nature of this deposit was confirmed by looking under a series of rather complicated uh, techniques. One is, well, not so complicated, perhaps polarized light, and then something which is called the backscatter electron detection combined with elemental 
X-ray analysis. So all of that tells him that these are, have the right physical property and resemble the material which is found in, um, in nature, which is found in the moon milk. They conclude that these findings support the idea that bacteria-like filaments are found in, in moon milk and that uh, it suggests very strongly that these, that the moon milk has a biogenic origin, that these microbes are involved instead of being abiotic, that it's just happening by precipitation. Uh, however, what they say is, let me quote, the metabolic activities evaluated in vitro were not always related to the genetic predisposition of individual strains, as some isolates with greater genetic potential remain metabolically silent. In other words, they may have the genes, but they are not expressed. So that's, you know, makes it a little bit iffy. However, they say this may simply be because they're growing in the conditions which are too different from the environmental ones. Worse, however, they point out that the majority of microbes found in moon milk are in fact not actinomycetes, but uncultivated organisms. So at least they're not cultivable actinomycetes, and we don't know what they are. So that's where it leaves us. They think that the proteomic analysis will tell. Anyhow, there are two basic questions. One is, are bacteria involved in the formation of moon milk? And second is, why is the resulting moon milk so different from other shapes and forms which exist in caves? So I like this paper because of its, it's a noble attempt, okay? It's a noble attempt to study a very complex situation in a natural sample. Lots of factors, lifeless and life living, come into play, and the interactions are staggering in numbers. So it's not surprising that this is difficult stuff. This is a good example of how hard it is to figure out even something as simple sounding as making milk in a cave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially because, um, as earlier work showed, it's complex communities of many different types of microbes that live in this milk, and they're right. probably setting up food chains. Um, so I understand why they just took one or two and tried to set up a, an experimental system to parallel it, but probably they're leaving out. They haven't yet added in key well, partners. But wait, that that's true, but they got what they wanted. They got these bugs to do what they, something very similar to what happens right. in reality. Right. So in a sense, you can say that in the lab, these bugs are sufficient. Mm -hmm. To nucleate. Whether that's what happens in nature is a very difficult question. You, you, right. You're not going to get at it by isolating more bugs. I mean, like they're right, maybe looking at proteomics will help. I don't know. What, what do you think? What, uh, if you did proteomics on moon milk, what would it tell us? <sighs> I wish I knew. They, it's their statement. Yeah, I noticed. They say this Sporting. would, this would I, solve it, but I don't understand how it would because... Well, it would extend the repertoire of bacteria involved. Yeah. Because you could relate the proteomics to uh, metagenomics. In other words, you could say, well, these are... And, and then do more uh, phylogenetic analysis. That is... If you had the proteins that are there, you can say, well, what are the genes that are there? And are these genes, in fact, who do they belong to? They belong to Streptomyces or they belong to something else? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, yeah, I think that would work. And presumably yeah. these proteins would have some role, or some of them would have some role in, well, in deposition. Then of you, start, you start over with that yeah. because, you know, how do you know that? Yeah, it's hard. Because finding proteins there does not really tell you that that's important. So, it's, I mean, it's just, it sounds so simple and it's beastly complicated. Maybe a broader question, which our audience may be thinking, is why do we care how the calcium carbonate formations get there? Well, you heard about CO2, haven't you? <laughs> yes, I have. There, there you go. I mean, these are part of the CO2 cycle. And if you're going to worry about uh, CO2 and uh, extra CO2 being released in the atmosphere, you have to worry about all CO2 in all forms. Mm -hmm. And this is one of them. So it, it may not be a huge role that they play, but it's an exemplar. It's, a, it's an example of what happens to CO2. And uh, it may relate to formation of limestone, formation of... Uh, carbonate rocks, you know, like limestone and many others. So it adds to our knowledge of how CO2 is involved in nature. That's, I think, the general answer. And that microbes are everywhere, <laughs> everywhere you look. <laughs> and, and, well, it's, it's worse. Microbes matter everywhere. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> the, the first sentence of this introduction of this paper is, the hypogean environment sustains a diverse microbial life. Of course, that's subterranean, right? Right. Hypogean. Hypogean. Geo, geo is geo, earth. And Geography, then, geology. There's a subterranean microbiome. that, And we know how this some of this microbiome plays a role in, in some of the effects in caves already, right? Mineral deposits. Yeah, well, you know, these ca uh, caves which are made of limestone yeah. come about because of bacterial action. There is uh, enough uh, H2S coming through to produce, for the bacteria to oxidize it and make it into sulfuric acid. Mm -hmm. And the bacteria are miners. They mine away That's the right. rock and they leave a hole. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, bacteria are, you, you cannot be a geologist without knowing something about bacteria. Yeah, if, you, if, uh, if you're listening and haven't heard about this, go back. We'll put a link to Hazel's TWIM in uh, the show notes. It was, she explained. You have it? When, the, when, when was that? By let's the way. see. Hazel Barton was on TWIM number 51. <laughs> mm. Wow. It was She's terrific, by the way. Back in 2013, she, yeah. Uh, she is maybe one of the leading micro or speleo microbiologists. That's right, speleo, <laughs> speleo microbiologist. Speleo microbiology, yeah. cave microbiology. It is now. It's a good word. <laughs> Tell us where you found the paper, Elio, because that's kind of interesting. Actually, this is interesting. It came to me, uh, it, it, it showed up first, it, it's published in Frontiers in Microbiology, but it showed up first in this website that does uh, preprints. What's it called? The Bioarchive. Bioarchive. That's it. So, and it was sent to me by uh, Kevin Young, who's in Arkansas, and mm -hmm. whom you may know as being a phenomenal writer about the importance of bacterial morphology, of cell shape. Uh, so he's concerned with that, but he's also a broad-based guy. And so he thought, he thought of me because this would be the kind of thing that we post in our blog, Small Things Considered. And so this, this piece is going to have a dual life. It's going to be part of the podcast and part of the blog. But this is, I would have missed it. I mean, I, I, well, I don't know, perhaps I would have caught it in going through the table of contents of uh, Frontiers. By the way, I, can I say something about how mm -hmm. I do my work? Sure. Um, I, I, I look for things which are both blog worthy and uh, podcast worthy. So that means that when I look at the table of contents of about, I don't know, 25 or so journals that I subscribe to, I don't look for what's important. I look for what's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> it's not always the same thing. And so by looking at things which are blog worthy and podcast worthy, I usually pick up oddities, things that people sh may not know about, they may have missed, where the reaction is, gee, I should have known that. So anyhow, Kevin responded to that, and I'm very grateful to him. That's a great story. By the way, uh, Elio, Malox is uh, aluminum hydroxide and magnesium oh. hydroxide. Oh, sorry. So it's not carbonate. No. Okay. I mean, calcium carbonate may have some anti-acid effects, but it's not in Malox. It's no problem. All right. By the way, right. Elio, uh, this morning before I came to the lab i was pulling weeds before it got hot i was outside pulling weeds in my backyard uh, and i saw this mushroom and i thought of you hey it was, well, i should take a picture because it's hard to describe send me a picture what color was it it was orange 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 and it my was goodness. it was made of it wasn't a typical body it had it was just a um it looked like an a oval cap and a stem no cap and stem it was just this weird thing coming out of the ground it was orange and it, it, it's almost an o-shaped thing uh, but I, I'll uh, I'll, I'll send you a picture. What, what did it taste it. like? No, don't, don't, don't eat it. Don't eat it. <laughs> no, I didn't you know what we say in mushroom circles? Once. You can eat any mushroom once. once. I love it. Yes. Yeah. yeah that's We'd great. miss you, Vincent. We would miss no, you. No, I wouldn't eat uh, anything coming out of the ground. But I just looked at it. You know, if you uh, there's all kinds of stuff in the in the ground. When you get down there pulling weeds, you really see some interesting stuff. It's true, you know, for you. and most people don't look at it. They just say, ah, it's just weeds, you know, but boy, it's so interesting. And then in the early morning when it's not too hot, it's really fascinating. Anyway, that's cool. Uh, BioArchive, we just sent our first two, two papers to BioArchive in the past few weeks. I'd never done that before. Wow. And what's your experience been like? It's very easy to post mm -hmm. and um, you can update it as it goes through the review process. So then we submitted it to a journal and you can say, okay. 
here's the modified version that we sent back, and here's the accepted version. You can go all the way to the end. But what I found nice is that uh, people comment on it because a lot of people are looking at this, and you get interactions right away before you even get your paper published. So it's kind of interesting. But I like the idea that it's out there initially. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And were they informed comments? Were these yeah, virologists? I mean, these are virologists who are basically, they probably have a search on to, for anything that gets published there in their area, you know. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, Or I mean, by pe- established people like yeah, yourself. Yeah, people working in the field. I mean, I don't think, I think for some papers that may have a broad interest, uh, maybe the general public might get involved, but it's, it's open access. Anyone can see these papers, but um, mm-hmm. for the most part, it's a science conversation, yeah. I, I think it's interesting. I like it. I like the idea that you can put something up there and people can see it. And, you know, the public, which who can't often see a lot of articles that are behind paywalls, can see these. And if they get accepted, they can see them there. So I think it's kind of nice. All right. Uh, we uh, we have a paper now I'm going to tell you about. But uh, we do have later on at the end of TWIM, we're going to give away a copy of Microbe. We have a number of entries in the contest. and. uh I will let you know who wins one copy at the end. Uh, I, have I think the, it's a pretty good book, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> what do you What do you think, Michelle? You think it's a good book? <laughs> I do. There's always uh, room for improvement. We're looking for for feedback, but yeah, we're excited about it. Always can improve. You know, we're on the fourth edition of our virology book, and wow, we're, we're either third or fourth. We're we're already planning for the next edition. We're going to start writing it next year, and it can always make it better. I'm just happy to have the opportunity to to redo it all the time. Mm, yeah. All right, I have I have a paper for you. Uh, for, it was just published in Cell Reports, and this is called "Using Resurrected Ancestral Proviral Proteins to Engineer Virus Resistance." And the authors are Asuncion Delgado, Rocio Arco, Beatriz Ibarra Molero, Jose Sanchez Ruiz. How did I do, Elio? Okay. Terrific. Muy bien. Muy bien. <laughs> bien hecho. <laughs> this is from uh, the uh, University of Granada, which is in the Granada, Spain, of course. Granada, tierra soñada por mi. Sorry about that. Oh, well, you have a nice voice. <laughs> That's very good. Yeah, right. <laughs> have you been to Granada? Yes, I have. What a place. The Alhambra is there. It's fantastic. Yes. I'm not sure. I, I am really eager to go back. Yeah. And the tapas are delicious. Okay, well, you're making me hungry. I haven't had lunch yet. Okay. And it's 2.30 already. All right, so what's going on in this paper? Very interesting title. This is about a virus and a bacterial virus, in fact. The idea is, as we all know, in order for viruses to replicate, they require many host proteins because viral genomes are pretty much minimal. Even the biggest viral genomes can't encode enough proteins to to replicate, and that's why viruses are parasites of host cells. And over the years, people have wanted to identify specific host proteins that viruses uh, require, that are required for virus replication. And they're looking at this as a way of of controlling uh, viruses. They seem to be interested in plant viruses. The idea would be if you have a protein of the host that's essential for virus replication, you could knock it out, and the the virus can't replicate. Of course, if it's an essential protein for the host, that's no good. You can't knock it out and expect the host to survive. So what what can you do? So they have this idea, and that's where the pro-viral factor of the title comes into play. The pro-viral is something in the host that is required for virus replication. Their idea is, what if we could use an, an ancestral version, an old version of one of these proviral host proteins. It could still work for the host, and maybe it wouldn't work for the virus anymore because uh, over the many, many millions of years, we know that uh, viruses and hosts are are part of an arms race. So the virus requires a protein from the host, so the host changes it, so hosts arise that are have a slight change in that protein, and they're now resistant to the virus. And then the virus, of course, will evolve to overcome the change, and so on and so forth, back and forth. You have this continuous evolution, which is called an arms race. And so the idea is, if you had an old 
host protein, maybe today contemporary viruses wouldn't be unable to use it. So that's the idea behind this paper. And they're going to test it using the venerable bacteriophage T7 of E. coli, uh, one of the uh, phages that was used for many years to study molecular genetics. It's a tailed bacteriophage with a double-stranded DNA genome. And this is the best part of T7, in my view. The generation time is 17 minutes. (laughs) Wow. 17 minutes, the virus will go through one replicative cycle from infection to production of new phages. (laughs) <laughs> and they said, and they said you could even get it down to eleven minutes in the laboratory. Yeah, so you can do uh, you can do a plaque assay in a day. You start it in the morning, and by the end of the day, the plaques are there. Wow! So the host protein that they are going to use—it's an E. coli host protein. It's called thioredoxin, and thioredoxins are proteins that are—they act as antioxidants. So oxidation, of course, is the loss of electrons. So what these thyrodoxins do is they they reduce other proteins uh, and in so doing prevent oxidation. They're found in all organisms, have many, many substrates. Uh, and so they, they, they like this because they think that because there's so many substrates of thyrodoxin, the interactions are not probably very specific. And so that might be good for their purpose. Now, thyrodoxin, of E. coli, it turns out that the DNA polymerase of T7, it's a four subunit complex. One of the subunits is thioredoxin, right? So it is, besides the viral DNA polymerase and a couple of other proteins, thioredoxin from E. coli is part of the DNA polymerase complex, and it's needed for DNA polymerization. In fact, thioredoxin is what we call a processivity factor which means processivity is a word that we use, which means when a DNA polymerase is moving along a template, we call it processive if it keeps going without falling off. And the longer the DNA that's made, the more processive the enzyme is. Because some enzymes are not very good at sticking to the DNA. They fall off. They make short DNAs. They're not very processive. But proteins like thyroidoxin improve this property of processivity. And what thyroidoxin does, it binds the DNA polymerase and probably prevents it from falling off the DNA. So the polymerase can keep on working. So it's a smart, in a way, it's a very smart protein because it has several, a whole lot of functions. Oh, oh yeah. Thyroidoxin is a multiplicity of functions. It is only one of them, this uh, binding to the DNA polymerase. And it must contribute to this very short generation time, huh? I guess, yeah. I mean, that's part of it. You have to make a lot of DNA quickly, for sure. So processivity. Right. In fact, I'm sure that people have over the years studied, you know, mutants that are less processive and they probably, mm-hmm. I'm sure they have a long generation time. And in fact, we're going to look at generation time here in this paper. So thyroidoxin binds specifically to the DNA polymerase. It recognizes a very specific part of the polymerase protein. And um, they think that's part of why it, it uh, over how its function is, uh, is, is done this processivity function. The authors think that maybe an ancient thyroidoxin did not have this property of binding T7 polymerase, because that's just a a guess, because maybe T7 wasn't around, and we're talking about many, many millions of years ago. So maybe... I must say, I I find this very ingenious. Who dreams this? Who would dream this one up, you know? Well, you know, it seems obvious uh, once you hear it, but it's, yeah, it's, it's very great. ingenious. So the and idea, then to realize there's a whole field of people doing this kind of work. It's like, yeah. All right. So, <laughs> so you may be uh, thinking, paleo, paleoenzymology. You may be mm-hmm. thinking, where do you get these old proteins? Ancient proteins don't exist anymore, right? right. Yeah, that's true. They don't exist. Um, so, what do you do? Well, you can make educated guesses about what proteins looked like years ago. You look at cont- all the contemporary proteins that we have. So you could take thyroidoxin and look at all the thyroidoxins in different organisms. You could see how much they vary, what amino acid positions change, and you can make approximations of what the proteins looked like many, many millions of years ago. And people do this. So the authors in this of this paper actually have taken advantage of this kind of paleoenzymology that others have done. They have predicted what old proteins might look like, and they have made the proteins. You can make the DNA. You can 
it produce the protein in an in a organism. They have shown these thyroidoxins. And we're talking about putative Precambrian thyroidoxins. For, begin, the Precambrian period began 4.6 billion years ago. 4.6 billion. billion. Billion, not million. A long time ago. And so they have predicted thyroidoxins from this era. We don't know if it's right, but they work. They're stable. They're enzymatically active. And so these authors have I taken forgot, advantage made, of They're made uh, chemically, the proteins. Well, you make the, uh, the DNA. You synthesize the DNA, right? And then you put it in uh, an organism, E. coli, I guess. And oh, you, I you see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. they're, they're pretty long proteins, so uh, that's the easiest way to do it. So that's where they get the ancient thyroidoxins from, from these other authors who have published about them. And what they do is they take E. coli in this paper. The e. coli has two thyroidoxins uh, made by two genes. You can obtain E. coli deficient in these two genes where the genes are missing. This E. coli grows, but it grows very slowly, much more slowly than wild type, but it does grow. And then they can introduce plasmids encoding these ancient thioreductases and ask, what's the effect on E. coli growth? And how does it affect phage T7 replication? All right, so that's the approach. It's a relatively straightforward approach. Of course, it depends on having ancient proteins, which is really, really tricky. So the Precambrian E. coli, and, so they have E. coli, and they've also made a Precambrian human thyroidoxin. Of course, humans weren't around 4.6 billion years ago, but they can, they can take human thyroidoxins and make them ancient. Uh, these enzymes are all highly active in vitro, and as I said, they put the genes encoding them they they um, introduce them into the E. coli, lacking their own thioreductin or reductase gene. So here's here are some of the ancestral thioreductins that they made. One of them is the last bacterial common ancestor. So they think this is the bacteria, the ancestor to all current bacteria. They have another one, the last cyanobacterial Deinococcus and thermus ancestor. That's about 2.5 billion years old. They have the last archaeal common ancestor, and then they have an archaeal eukaryotic common ancestor. Now, when you put the genes encoding these ancient proteins into E. coli, they all complement uh, E. coli growth. So E. coli, wild type, grows nicely. You can do a nice growth curve, and they have graphs of this. Without the two thyroreductases, it doesn't grow well. It grows slowly. And they can put each of these ancient uh, thyroreductin genes in. E. coli grows pretty much better in each case. Uh, the best is the last cyanobacterial Deinococcus and thermus ancestor thyroreductin. That's the best. That complements almost as well as E. coli. And that's it's about 57% identical to the E. coli enzymes. Amazing. It complements pretty well. The worst is the last archaeal common ancestor. It doesn't complement very well. So that's the first thing. These old predicted proteins apparently can work uh, in E. coli to make it grow better. They also did a neat experiment where they do growth curves at different temperatures, ranging from 21 to 42 degrees Celsius. And they want to know maybe you know if the proteins are... St- they have different stabilities at different temperatures. Would this make a difference to the complementation of the E. coli growth defect? And one of the ideas here is that the Precambrian oceans were pretty hot, so maybe the, the proteins that were around then were more stable than contemporary proteins. And in fact, they find that they know that the this LPBCA thyroidoxin, again, that's the last cyanobacterial Deinococcus thermus ancestor, um, that's the most thermostable, and this is the ancestor of many modern thermophilic bacteria. So it makes sense that the protein is stable. So what they find, they, again, they do a range of temperatures, growths at different temperatures from 21 to 42 using E. coli, wild type, and with all of these ancient uh, en- enzyme genes in them. And they find, in general, there's a linear relationship between uh, the fitness of E. coli, the generation time, and uh, the sequence identity. So in other words, the closer the ancient enzyme and sequence is to the modern E. coli, the better it grows at a variety of temperatures. Uh, can I make a little yeah, comment yeah, about yeah, sure. the, what the data they present? This is a hobby horse of mine. This is something that I, <laughs> um, I, I deal with a lot. 
uh, they show the growth on a linear scale. Mm -hmm. Okay, that means that since growth is exponential, your eye cannot tell mm -hmm. whether two growth rates are the same or not. And if they had plotted the, the data on a semi-log plot, you could tell because that's the then it becomes a linear function. It doesn't matter. I'm not saying this invalidates the paper at all, but I think it's just it's the wrong it's the wrong thing to show. So when they talk about fitness, which they by which they mean growth rate, mm -hmm. numerically, I'm sure the conclusions are right. I'm sure the overall conclusions are right, but the actual the actual numbers may not be. It's mm -hmm. Just a hobby horse of mine. I'm sorry. No, it's a good point. I think you're you're right. And and if I, I guess if you had reviewed this, you would have asked them to plot it differently, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, to see if it so, such a simple thing is what everybody does. The other thing is they use their own medium. They use um, uh, LB medium, and LB medium is only good for. And they they take out the glucose. Mm -hmm. uh, it has no fermentable carbohydrate. It has not enough magnesium. It's not a medium in which you can determine growth rates accurately so that's another hobby horse and their their od goes way up so it's it's that's just not the way to do the experiment i don't think but again it does not invalidate what is otherwise a gorgeous paper mm -hmm. and yeah having said that all the ancient thioreduxin uh proteins <laughs> are they're do, helping e coli above what e coli can do without that protein right. so they've got mm -hmm. the nice mutant and then yeah. you do maybe and maybe that's they got it by using <laughs> this medium <laughs> who knows what maybe. it would look like if it did yeah yeah they all work that's that's the point and um there which seems is amazing to, uh, there seems to be i don't, don't want to sound like an old grouch no no I, I think if you have worked on these your career you were absolutely right to say that yeah it's a good point maybe if the authors listen uh to this podcast they can respond to that the one exception to this general relationship between Generation time and sequence identity with the E. coli thyroidoxin is this LPBCA protein, again, the last cyanobacterial Dinococcus thermus ancestor, where it's even more fit. And this is, the again, the ancestor of all the today's uh, thermophiles. So maybe that's consistent mm. with that. All right. So these proteins allow E. coli growth better than without the E. coli thyroidoxin genes. Now the question is, does phage T7 grow on them? They do a very simple experiment where they take each E. coli strain, and they simply do a plaque assay. They infect with phage T7. They plate out on uh, on an overlay of the bacteria, and they count plaques on lawns of the different E. coli. Very simple experiment. Uh, if you take E. coli, either wild type or the double mutant complemented with E. coli thioredoxin gene, you get about 10 to the ninth plaque-forming units per milliliter. Now, the only one that uh, worked for virus infection was E. coli complemented with this LPBCA thioredoxin. That's the uh, last ancestor for cyanobacteria, et cetera, 2.5 billion years old. It has 50, about 57% amino acid identity to E. coli, but they get very few plaques with that host, about 100 per mil or less. The efficiency of virus propagation is 10 to the minus eighth compared to wild type. All right, so um, it doesn't grow very well. Uh, and some of these plaques that they have appear to have virus mutants that are better uh, able to utilize the ancient thyroidoxin. So in, in you know just one round of placking, viruses have already emerged that have changes in them that can better use this ancient protein. But no plaques were detected with any of the other ancestral thyroidoxins, none of those that I mentioned, bacterial common ancestor, archaeal, eukaryotic, et cetera. No plaques at all. And and we should point out, they looked pretty hard. They plated, what, 15 yeah. lawns? Yes, they did it over um, and over again. Right? Over and over. So if they would have seen, I mean, yeah, they can be pretty confident of yeah. their numbers. So it, it their idea works, their proof of concept that you take an ancient protein, but E. coli can still use it pretty well. And But the phage apparently is compromised in, in being able to use thyroidoxin as part of its uh, DNA polymerase. They even try overproducing the thyroidoxin and they don't get much more efficient uh, phage uh, replication. They also tried a, synthet a synthetic collection of phage T7 mutants which is made by growing the virus for 200 generations in the presence of a mutagen, and they don't get any increased placking on these various uh, E. coli. So, uh, it's really an amazing, that, that result is just beautiful. It's very nice, right? So an yeah, old enzyme, it. an old enzyme 
Uh, it doesn't work for a modern virus. It's and very it works fine in E. coli. Now, I they would like to do this for to engineer plants that are resistant to plant viruses. So they're going to go looking. You know, they have lots of plant genes, and they're going to probably make some ancient versions of those proteins in the plants and see if they can uh, introduce these into plants and make them resistant. So I'm I would be concerned about mutation because even in even though in their experiments they don't see a lot of mutation of the virus to, to overcome these these changes. Viruses are very good at doing this, and in the wild it may be a different story. So, And RNA viruses are particularly good. Of which that's most of the viruses in plants are RNA viruses, yes. So would you engineer your plant to have two or three of these thioredux, ancient thioredoxins? Yeah, um, or, so that yeah, exactly. If you assume that the mutation is recessive. Yeah, I think that's um, what you'd have to do is do multiple mm-hmm. ones so that uh, you could mm. make sure so the, there was... The re- odds of getting multiple yeah. mutations. It's like using... Triple therapy uh, for, for HIV, right? right? HIV, yeah. 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 right. Right. I was wondering if they'd have codon usage issues. That's a good point. Yeah, I don't know exactly how the ancient proteins, they must have been made using contemporary codon utilization, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to produce them uh, in E. coli. But who knows what the ancient codon looked like, right? Usage looked yeah. like. Yeah. So that that is, I'm amazed that an old protein with 57% identity to E. coli works <laughs> in E. coli, right? It's very cool. They do point out that they were smart about uh, what experimental system to use. They used a, a, this protein thioreduxin, reduxin, why I can't say that word today, I don't know. But um, it doesn't work in a large protein complex. So yeah. it doesn't seem, it's probably not as constrained evolutionarily, yes. yeah. um, its yeah. structure. So they were they were really um, the choice, smart. The, the choice is brilliant. Yep. I was interested to know why the old thioreduxins don't work for T7? Is it because they don't bind the polymerase or do they bind the polymerase, but they're not, they can't affect processivity? I think that would be interesting, but they, they, that's not what they're I imagine they'd be looking at that. I don't know. Someone might. Somebody yeah. should. Yeah. Anyway, that's a, it's, a, it's a pretty story. I like it very much. It's lovely. I really like the discussion because they take you systematically on how you can take this same strategy to engineer crops, as you said, that that yep. could be resistant to viruses that wipe wipe out cash crops. Yep, yep. Well, that's it uh, for that one. I, I like that very much, and I'm looking forward to them trying this in plants. They say there are plenty of uh, plant proteins that are known to be important. Uh, I learned just last week on uh, Twiv that uh, most plant viruses are in fact uh, RNA viruses. There are some DNA plant viruses, but most of them are RNA. So that may be a problem in terms of resistance, but we'll see. We'll look forward to it. So this project was led by a senior postdoc in the lab, Asuncion Delgado. She writes that she's an enthusiast of biology and became interested in microbiology first um, when she was a PhD student at the University of Granada. She studied biodegradation by microbes. And then for her postdoc, she moved uh, to California, Elio. She was at UCLA and studied transcriptional regulation. Then uh, she and others in the lab were working on this project. Um, She admits that it was kind of a side project, but she was quite interested in it and kept it alive while she was working on other things and was really uh, delighted when the story came together and they were able to um, publish it. So she left the lab um, two years ago, and since then she has been focusing on education, um, which she said fulfills both her personal and professional aims. And she is living with uh, her husband and two teenage boys, 17 and 15 years old, who she says are her first priority in life right now. So... um, (laughs) <laughs> that is like uh, a delightful the, person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And she, she does point out that, um, you know, the academic science is pretty tough in Spain right now. It's harder to get positions and funding. Um, but she's found a path where she is fulfilling her goals. Nice. Look forward to, uh, more of this in other organisms. It's an interesting idea. Yeah. And, and they reference a couple reviews that lay out how you can systematically um, do this mining in the paleo genomes to mm-hmm. design a resistance locus. Nice. All right. Uh, that is TWIM 157. I'm going to now tell you about the book contest. We had, let's see how many entrants. We had 
31 people respond with emails uh, to win a, a copy of Microbe. I think that's a record. You should be very proud of that. Everyone wants a copy of your book. <laughs> <laughs> and they all wrote, I love symbionts, which is, a, which is the requirement in the, in the email subject line. So let me tell you about some of these. Uh, Abe writes, I'm a mathematics professor married to a neuroscientist. Science and nature are the focus of our lives. I listen to all the Microbe TV podcasts religiously, particularly when doing yard work to maintain the complex ecosystem in the large woods surrounding our rural Wisconsin home. Mm. Can't wait mm. until my one-year-old daughter is old enough to use a microscope. So many great microorganisms to discover in the soil, forest, and stream. How long until I can get an easy-to-use home DNA RNA sequencer for our workshop? <laughs> <laughs> Won't be long. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, Aaron writes, uh, my name is Aaron. I'm a microbiology major at Brigham Young. I only recently discovered Twix, and I'm excited to continue to listen. I love the hidden world that's happening around us and how you help us better understand it. Elizabeth said she's been an avid listener for about a year. She has an hour-long commute and has been enjoying catching up. She's a chemistry senior tech. Diane is an avid listener of all the podcasts, teaches microbiology at Louisburg College in Louisburg. It's 34 degrees with more humidity than I care to think about today. Just finished listening to episode 156. Very interested in a copy of Microbe for my students. They are challenging me more and more each year. So I continue to search for new material to share with them. Your podcasts are a wonderful source. Uh, keep up the great work. Pedro wants to thank us for a great show. I'm an entomologist that developed a great interest in microbial symbionts during my PhD. Back then, I was, I was working with gut symbionts of ants and bees. I'm currently a postdoc in Brazil working with gut symbionts of lepidopterans. TWIM has helped me substantially in developing a broader view of microbiology, and I really enjoy listening to you while I'm doing lab work. It's the best kind of multitasking. Uh, Peter writes... Uh, New listener here. I'm a PhD student at Trinity College, Dublin. I really enjoy listening to podcasts in the lab. I'm a crystallographer, so the work can become repetitive. Listening to science-based podcasts is a great way to keep my brain engaged. 77 and cloudy and human in Dublin. Rachel uh, <laughs> says uh, she, she missed the last competition a day late. She's a junior doctor in the UK, enjoying TWIM, hoping it will help as I'm applying for microbiology training posts. Johan is starting his major in microbiology and immunology this fall. If you could give me one precious advice that you wish someone had told you before starting your journey in this complex yet fascinating culture. Hmm. I, I could. Go ahead. Study math. Really? Yep. Hmm. That's interesting. It's, How about it's more and more necessary. I mean, bioinformatics is a tool that's completely universal now. And to to follow it and to be able to use it properly and to contribute to it takes mathematics. Mm -hmm. About you, Michelle? I guess my advice would be to find a lab to join, even if it's, you know, 15 hours a week, because then you see how what you're learning in the classroom can really be put to use and how it ties together. It helps build a conceptual framework that's easier then to expand on. So And how they use mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. I, I totally agree. Well, I would add, um, read, read as much as you can. I think it's really good to do that. Anthony writes, I love symbionts. If you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> Anna, I love symbio. Hello, fellow symbiophiles. It's been a long time since I first thought of writing you to so thank you for all the wonderful work you put into the podcast. Today, the inducement of the micro book giveaway finally moved this desire to the top of the list. Started listening to TWIV, added TWIM, TWIP, and TWIVO to my favorite podcast lists. Above all, I love science and learning. I think this has been reflected in a less than linear career path as I have found so many different things distractingly fascinating. She's been a virologist, microbiologist, a virologist, molecular biologist, and virologist again, always following the opportunities. I'm happy to report I have done plaque assays. Your podcasts are a valuable source of scientific information and banter. Wishing you all fascinating discoveries and wonderful symbiosis. She is in Harpenden, UK, where after a few weeks of summer, we are back to the traditional British summer weather, 21C and cloudy. Jamie wants to thank us for the show. He discovered it at age 15 after trawling the internet for answers to my microbe questions. 
Hmm. And this, this inspired me to pursue a career in microbial sciences research. I now am a second year majoring in microbiology and biochemistry and loving the show. Wow. Lin- I might put that on my refrigerator. Oh, sure. <laughs> Linda is from Sydney, Australia, middle of winter there. My, it's 18C. She is an RN. Took a job 18 months ago in a hospital uh, in preparation for emerging infectious diseases and led her to uh, Virology 101 and TWIV and TWIM. Thanks for many thanks for the inspiration. Magnus, I have a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and molecular biology, but moved into bioinformatics. He is in southern Denmark. I love your show. Boy, are we being international? Wow. Yeah, it's great to figure out who's actually out there listening. George is a senior at the University of Rochester studying neuroscience, listens to TWIM and TWIV, and is hooked. Uh, Stig is... uh, well, he, today it's gray and cloudy with high humidity. He loves Twivo, Twim, and Twiv, uh, and loves. thanks us for a great show. Trudy writes, Dear Twim by Aunts. I may not write in very often, but I listen to all your shows. I recently learned that ASM Microbe will be taking place in Atlanta next year, and although I'm only a lowly patent agent, I will do my best to attend, and I look forward to shaking hands with each of you. Please do. Neha mm. Neha is a college freshman looking to study microbiology. She found our podcast. She's working uh, as an IT intern studying patient records this summer. And I find it magical to listen about ma- microbes at the same time. Thank you for making this experience possible. Galen has recently started binging on TWIM. It's a little strange <laughs> going back in time with weekly updates on the weather across the country, but I'm getting used to it. Alio's weather report is a nice anchor. No matter what's going on elsewhere, San Diego is always 72 and sunny. <laughs> I'm about to matriculate in a PhD program in Oregon. I've been working at the Broad Institute in Cambridge. This podcast has helped me clear the cobwebs out as I prepare to go back to school. You're doing a fantastic job of making science accessible. Uh, Sarah started listening about a year ago. She's an undergrad in Dublin. She's now working as a medical scientist in a hospital specializing in medical microbiology. Uh, Hope is trying another shot at a book. Jake is a postdoc at MIT. Christopher uh, is a longtime listener, loves listening to the different methodologies. He's working at a hospital. Tanner is in Salt Lake City, 86 degrees and sunny. Elise loves symbionts. I really do as I work with Brady Rhizobium diazo efficiens a legume symbiont right and she writes well generally i would characterize it as a love-hate relationship because it grows so slowly <laughs> chandler first time i listened to your podcast was required for a bio course but since then i've been listening non-stop thanks for putting on an awesome show uh, tribly found the podcast while i was looking for some science podcast working as a dietitian i work as a painter now so i have eight hours a day to work my way through the old episodes. After a few weeks of this, I decided to pursue a degree in microbiology. That's cool. Yay. He's in Victoria, British Columbia. Eric is a PhD student in Melbourne. His PhD is on dissimilatory nitrate reduction to ammonium in soil. The show that got me hooked on TWIM was number 147, The Public Goods Dilemma, where Alio read out the poetic opening paragraph to killing by type 6 secretion drives genetic phase separation and correlates with increased cooperation. And you all went on to discuss this fascinating paper. So just a few more. Luis is a senior scientist at Indigo, an innovative startup in Boston that develops agricultural products from endophytes. Uh, and uh, he did a postdoc with Marilyn Rusink at Penn State. Please, if I win the book, send it to Hope, the high school student from Maine who sent his email for the book contest last time. I trust the book can keep his interest in a STEM career. Nice. That's sweet. Uh, Sitara is a fairly new listener, but he's been reading Small Things Considered since 2012 when I was a college freshman. It introduced me to my favorite microbe, the one that got me interested in studying my cell-shaped, long-branching South African mine bacterium with a (laughs) star-shaped cross-section. Very much, (laughs) very much love. Glad to hear that. And finally, John uh, writes, Hi, family Twimier, frequent listener of all the Twix podcasts. Unlike John, who won the last book, TWIM is my favorite. Perhaps that comes from the bias of being a microbiology and chemistry major, now pursuing a master's in environmental engineering with a research focus on using sulfate-reducing bacteria to remove dissolved arsenic from mine drainage water in passive bioreactors. The par- Good for you. The parasitoid wasp paper you discussed this week was actually from the school where I recently got my undergrad degree, University of Victoria. It brought me a great deal of pride 
to hear some local work getting broad recognition. Okay, we have 31 entrants. Who is going to be the winner? What I do is I numbered them all. I go to random.org, and we are going to generate a random number from 1 to 31. And the winner is number 11, Anna. Anna from Harpenden, UK is the winner. So I'll be in touch with you, Anna, and uh, we'll get your address and we'll send you this book. Isn't that lovely to hear where our listeners are from and what they're doing? It really is. It's great. Great great idea, Vincent. All right. That's TWIM157. You can find it at Apple Podcasts. You can find it at microbe.tv slash TWIM and ASM.org slash TWIM. We love getting your questions and comments. Send them to twim at microbe.tv. And consider, if you love what we do, becoming a patron of Twim and all the other podcasts. You can contribute in a variety of ways by going to microbe.tv slash contribute. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. It's a pleasure. You were sounding better this week. (laughs) I apologize (laughs) to our listeners. I was in a cave last week, it sounded like. Oh, was there calcium carbonate on the walls? <laughs> <laughs> it was a landline, so it's about that old. Elio Schechter, is it small things considered? Thank you, Elio. My pleasure. This was fun. You sound very good also this week. It's a good week. Oh, God, for, yeah, I'm really fine. Good week for well. Skype. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM. Chris Kandine and Ray Ortega for their technical help. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. See you next time on This Week in Microbiology.